Okay, thanks very much to John and Patrick and Ford for the invitation to be here. It's really been a, a treat and I'm having a great time, as I think most people are. Um, the work that I'm gonna talk about today is work that we've been doing in my lab over the past two to three years. Some of it is new and unpublished and others of it, bits of it were published earlier this year. Um, it's work that we've done, so actually everyone's from the University of Miami. Um, and I have a new collaborator at the medical school, uh, Chuck Lucci, um, and James Baker in a microscopy facility. So um, these are the people all at the University of Miami who've been working on the, the data that I'm going to present <coughs> today. So over the past several years in my lab, we've been working mostly on this question of how do you go from the pie chart on the left, this, this diet of foam sap, to the pie chart on the right. Um, and so the challenge here is that uh, phloem sap and, and, and xylem sap um, and indeed blood doesn't contain sufficient nutrients to support um, or in the sort of appropriate amounts to support aphid growth um, and development in this case. And the way, as everyone here would know, these animals have got around this problem is that they formed ancient obligate intracellular symbioses with bacteria. Um, these bacteria are usually maternally transmitted. Um, so here on the left, we have an image of Buchnera invading an embryo very early in development. Buchnera are the small cells, little round cells in the middle. The bigger cells are on the outside of the aphid cells. Um, often these uh, symbiont cells get organized into an organ called the bacterium. And you can see this in an embryo down each side of the body there. Um, and they're, they, they live in specialized insect cells called bacteriocytes. Um, and so these bacteriocytes aggregate um, to make the bacterium. So between when I submitted the title for the talk and, and now, um, I started thinking about themes that are emerging um, as we sequence more and more paired genomes. So um, paired, when I say paired genomes, I'm talking about host plus symbiont genomes or the hollow symbiont genome. Um, and I think there's three themes um, or, or sort of uh, that, are, that are coming out of this. The first is collaboration. And Nancy um, set up a wonderful introduction to the, the things I'm going to talk about today. Yesterday, um, she showed a uh, the amino acid metabolism pathways from when the Buchnera genome was sequenced and pointed out that there were a couple of places where there were genes missing in those amino acid metabolism pathways in, in Buchnera. Um, as we sequenced the aphid genome, the p-aphid genome, it turns out that we came up with a new hypothesis. So when Suji and his colleagues first sequenced Buchnera, they proposed that the pathways were completed by promiscuous enzymes in the Buchnera genome. And sequencing the aphid genome resulted in a, a group of us proposing an alternative hypothesis, and that is that genes in the host genome actually mediate those reactions. Um, and it's turned out that as we sequence more and more paired genomes, there are more and more examples of this host symbiont within pathway metabolic complementarity. Um, I'm going to tell you an, a new story of, of one of those today um, that we have currently in review. Um, but this is emerging as a theme, that within pathways, um, you can't, you know, the host and the symbiont, I mean, it perfectly explains why this, the symbiont's not living outside the host, metabolism's not complete. Um, they can't make, uh, say, the branched-chain amino acids without using genes from both the host genome and the symbiont genome. The second theme is constraint. Um, so I think there's mounting evidence that um, in these systems we're seeing independent evolution of the same complementarity. Um, so the and, and I mean to put it naively, you kind of you're set with what you start with. You know the genes that are in the host genome constrain the places where you can have complementarity evolving between the bacterium and the host insect. Um, and I think this is actually goes a little further in that there's even constraint, and Nancy mentioned yesterday that um, the, the, the symbiont replacement was kind of long because when the new symbiont came, it, it evolved a whole new bacteriocyte, so from a whole new cell type. So as we see these systems evolving, 
the bactericide cells, I think, in these systems are not, you know, that, that's not the same cell type that's given rise to the bacterium in each of these insect lineages. And so there's a constraint there too, in that whatever the basal metabolism of that particular cell type was that gave rise to the new bacterium likely constrained the potential for coevolution um, in those systems. And in my lab, we've been talking some about the idea that this might explain some of the differences we're seeing between Okanorhynchins and Stonorhynchin insects. And then the third theme is change. And um, I think that seems to be a pretty common theme across everything that we've been hearing about. Um, over the last day and a, well, I guess day and now, um, is that these systems are incredibly dynamic. Um, so change can involve symbiont replacement. It can involve um, acquisition of uh, genes from other bacterial genomes to host genomes. Um, and it can also involve gene duplications in host genomes and, and sort of expansions of gene families. Um, and that, this, that these processes are not things that happen at one point in time and then uh, things have diversified, but these processes are ongoing processes and that all the systems are very, very dynamic. So they're the, the sort of themes that I see emerging in the sense that there's multiple examples across the systems that we've been looking at um, that, that sort of shed light on this and that I, I see them emerging as patterns, I guess. Um, at the frontier right now, I think, uh, is an area where we, we don't have enough data from enough systems yet to be able to make any broad generalizations. But I'm hopeful that maybe some of the things that I'll tell you about today that we've recently discovered in my lab may actually turn out to be common mechanisms across these systems. Um, so I think right now the frontier is sort of this question of mechanisms of coexistence and control. Okay. so. There's three, probably too ambitiously, um, plan to tell you three stories today about work we've been doing in my lab. Um, the first one bears on collaboration um, and also uh, change. Um, the second on change, and the third is, is at the frontier. So the first about vitamin B5 biosynthesis or pantothenate biosynthesis in the PA fed. Um, so this is work that was done by Dan Price, who's a postdoc in my lab. Um, so here we have the pathway for, I need to find the pointer here. Um, we have the pathway for pantothenate biosynthesis or vitamin B5 biosynthesis. The blue dots here, um, this is basically the E. coli pathway. This is how E. coli um, makes uh, vitamin B5. And the purple dots uh, represent the genomes of Bugnera from six different aphid species. Um, for the aphid people, they'll probably figure out what those species are. For the rest, it's not really important what the species are. The important thing to notice here is that, um, that at the open circles indicate the gene is missing in those Bugnera genomes. Okay? And so we see that all Bugnera have lost the ability to make two oxoisovalerate from valine but they retain the ability to make it from pyruvate. Um, all of them have lost this gene, PAN-E, to convert to hydroxopantoate to pantoate, um, and they've all lost the ability to synthesize beta-alanine. Half of them, so this is the curious thing, and this is what led us to, um, to really pursue this, this project, um, is that three of the six book nera um, have lost pan B and three of the six have lost pan C, but the ones that retain um, these genes retain sort of identically fragmented pathways. So this is a common pattern in these symbionts is that you see these fragmented biosynthesis pathways that are apparently non-functional, but they're conserved over evolutionary time, which suggests that they are in some way functional. <coughs> Um, so a couple of important things to know is that this part of the pathway is not only important for uh, vitamin B5 biosynthesis, but it's also important to biosynthesis of two essential amino acids, valine and isoleucine. So that conservation here is important. Another important thing to know is that PAN-C, the only function this gene has is to mediate this re last step reaction in vitamin B5 biosynthesis. So the fact that it's retained in the symbiont genome strongly suggests that the pathway is functional. So, but we have two problems. Bucnera needs to get a supply of beta alanine, and there needs to be some complementation of PAN-E function here for the pathway to work. 
So it turns out that the P aphid has two ways to make beta alanine. Um, it has a biosynthesis pathway from uracil, and it can also convert aspartate into beta alanine. And if we look at expression of these genes in this pathway um, in whole insect, this data here, versus bactericide, and this is data from three different aphid lineages, with this is high expression to low expression, you see that the, the, the genes in the pathway from uracil to beta alanine um, are upregulated in bactericide cells, whereas the, bias, the gene um, for conversion of aspartate to beta alanine is downregulated in bactericides relative to whole insect. And so we argue that, um, Buchner, that the P aphid is synthesizing beta alanine in bactericides um, via the uracil degradation pathway for provision to Buchnera. And now to the second problem, this complementation of PAN-E. Well, it turns out that in Salmonella and E. coli, people have already demonstrated that this gene ILVC, which encodes keto acid reductoisomerase, which is used in that top part of the pathway that's conserved across all um, the Buchnera lineages, and is used for isoleucine and valine biosynthesis and then the top part of pantothenate biosynthesis. Um, it turns out that this enzyme also in E. coli and salmonella has limited to dehydroxopantanate 2 reductase activity. So that's the PAN-E um, activity that's been lost. But there's a couple of caveats. So in E. coli and salmonella, um, the ability of this uh, enzyme to function in pantothenate biosynthesis is much, much, much reduced relative to um, its activity as keto acid reductoisomerase. But the other part of it is that in order to create an E. coli pantoate oxytroph, it requires deletion of both the PAN-E and the ILVC genes. And so what Dan did was he um, performed a series of complementation tests. He um, got a hold of the E. coli mutant that has both these genes deleted. Um, and he, here are the results. This is with B5 supplementation um, without B5 supplementation. This is E. coli PAN-E, so the gene, the PAN-E gene um, complementation, Buchnera ILVC, E. coli ILVC, and then the negative control. And you can see that Buchnera ILVC rescues these mutants. So it's completing um, the, it, 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 it's completing that, that uh, you know, uh, synthesis of pantoate. Um, and we don't, unfortunately, have any data to follow up on this yet, but that it's tantalizing. This, this was comparison here is that we see that the, um, the activity of Buchnera ILVC is it seems to be doing a much, much better job. There's actually a few spots here with E. coli ILVC, but it's doing a much better job of complementing than the, the, the E. coli ILVC, which is known to have very low 2-dehydroxy-2 reductase activity. So, this Buchnera ILVC um, is a promiscuous enzyme that mediates both of these reactions. Um, and I haven't really put it as a, a point so much in here, but in, in the context of this meeting, it's relevant in the sense that this is another mechanism that facilitates genome reduction in these symbionts, is that it, enzymes evolving uh, promiscuous activity. Um, and there's the complete pathway of how we propose that this collaborative biosynthesis is working in vitamin B5 biosynthesis in the P aphid. Okay, so to the next step about change, and um, we need to, okay. So we started working on amino acid transporters in my lab after the P aphid genome was, was published, and that will become a little clearer in, in a bit. But amino acid transporters are transmembrane proteins that move amino acids from one side of membranes to the other. And membranes are something that these obligate intracellular symbioses have a lot of. Um, so first of all, dietary amino acids have to cut across the gut interface. They then move into the hemolymph. They then have to cross the bactericide membrane. Um, and then in, in many of these systems, and so true of the aphid system, um, the, the bacteria, the symbionts, are surrounded by a host-derived membrane that we call the symbiosomal membrane and then um, the inner and outer membranes of Buchnera. And so it's a little bit simplistic to say that non-essential acids go in and essential amino acids come out, but to, you know, for the purposes of now, we can do okay thinking of it like that. Um, so 
the first thing we did when we started doing this was we, we identified all the um, nutrient amino acid transporters in the PA for genome. Um, this was work that was done by Dan um, and Rebecca Duncan in my lab. And one thing we discovered was that where Drosophila um, has 20 of amino acid transporters in these two families, uh, the PA for it has 40, um, including this big expansion here in what is, this is the Drosophila and this is SlimFast, and there's this big expansion um, of, uh, in the PA fed. And so this result led me to speculate that um, maybe this, uh, the, this duplication of these amino acid transporters is something that's going to be characteristic of um, the evolution of host genome evolution in these systems where you have an obligate intracellular symbiont. So Rebecca, as part of her dissertation, set up to test um, this hypothesis. And um, these trees are two, I have a reduced one coming up next, but the, this paper was published in Molecular Ecology earlier this year. Here's the aphid, the P aphid expansion that I pointed out on the previous tree. Um, and so she looked also um, at other hemiptrons, including the citrus millibug, potato psyllid, white fly, um, and cicadas and kissing bugs. And the thing that jumps out here, I want you to notice these gray boxes, is that these gray boxes, one, two, three, and this one here, um, mark expansions, independent expansions in amino acid transporters in, it turns out, just Stonorankin insects. Um, so this was quite exciting to us and remarkable. And the thing, so this is the change. So there's this dynamic pattern where you're getting in these expansions in these insects that have these symbionts that are provisioning them with essential amino acids. Um, but you also, so here are the two trees stripped down to just show the aphid in red, um, the citrus mealybug in this aqua color, and then uh, usually dark blues, uh, drosophila, and, and body louse is purple here. Um, so the thing is we have these big expansions happening, but the other thing that we looked at is the expression. So how many of these transporters are recruited for expression at the symbiotic interface, so in bacteriocyte cells? Um, so the, the squares to notice here are the yellow ones. These are transporters that are expressed more highly in bacteriocytes relative to whole insect. So that these ones we would sort of talk about as being important to symbiotic function. Um, and the thing to notice, two things, is one, within these expansions, we have a very dynamic pattern where we have some that are recruited to the symbiotic interface and others that are not. Um, and again, here in mealybugs, the same sort of pattern. And another important thing to notice is that here, with a duplication event where this mealybug one, uh, this aphid one is highly expressed um, in, in bactericides, its ortholog in mealybugs is not. And so we have this really dynamic interface where the same transporters are not expressed in bactericides. Maybe this is consistent with the idea that bactericide origin is, is multiple and dynamic as well. Um, but change is a really uh, strong um, part of what's going on in these systems. So amino acid transporter evolution in Stonorankin insects is very dynamic, and, and it's also convergent in the sense that we see the same patterns happening, happening repeatedly and independently and at different time scales as well. So finally, to the frontier um, sort of area of mechanisms of coexistence and control. Um, and here we've really been asking this question of how are the host and symbiont metabolically and developmentally integrated. And this is, um, so of those 40 PA fit amino acid transporters, eight of them are expressed in bactericide cells. Um, and you can see there's kind of a break here as that, 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 that five of them are more expressed than the other three. So um, for reasons of really expense, because uh, making antibodies gets expensive, we, we focused on the top five um, transporters in the work we've been doing. Um, and this is where we started working with Chuck's group to use um, the Xenopus Lavis expression system to um, functionally characterize these transporters. So. Um, Simplistically, we generate uh, a synthetic RNA. Um, we microinject the Xenopus oocytes. We wait a couple of days for them to express the transporters and localize them to membrane. And then we use um, these uh, oocytes either in radio uptake experiments or in electrophysiology experiments. Um, okay, I better start flying. So, the long, uh, and so 
this is an experiment where we looked at um, glutamine transport or uptake of radio labeled glutamine by these five transporters. And only two of the transporters, 1018 and 8904, transported glutamine um, above background level. And you can see that 1018 does a much better job of it in this expression system than 8904. So that's, we started working with 1018. Um, we did a lot of experiments, but the one that's sort of most interesting to us right now is this experiment, a competition experiment. So the data I'm going to show you here is um, we basically, we competed um, transport of one millimolar labeled, radio labeled glutamine against 10 millimolar um, concentrations of all the other uh, protein amino acids. And so it's set to the control. So one millimolar labeled glutamine um, looks like this, 100% uh, transport. And then in competition with itself, um, we see that glutamine, so in competition with 10 millimolar unlabeled glutamine, we see that glutamine transport is reduced by 75%. And then with all the others, um, you see that the only um, other amino acid that reduces transport of glutamine and actually does a better job than glutamine itself is arginine. So um, we have a reduction in transport by about 90% in competition with arginine. It turns out that um, arginine isn't transported by this um, transporter. Uh, here is two experiments, um, with one with labeled glutamine and one with labeled arginine looking at uptake across a concentration gradient. And we can only start to get measurable transport of arginine at 5 millimolar um, and, and really at 10. And these concentrations where we can measure transport are, this is the inhibition constant at IC50. Um, at, so at 3.9 millimolar of arginine, we get um, an inhibition of transport of glutamine. Um, with several more experiments, um, it turns out that um, arginine actually is a competitive inhibitor of glutamine transport. And it does this at concentrations much lower than, than what it's effectively transported. And so we call this transporter APGLNT1, that surthocyphomyosin glutamine transporter 1, transports glutamine inhibited by arginine. And then we looked at um, where we find it. Um, it localizes to uh, the bactericide cell membrane. Um, and this localization pattern led us to start thinking about a model of regulation. And an important piece of information here um, is to know that aphids have actually lost the ability to make arginine. They don't have the urea cycle. Um, so arginine has become an essential amino acid. And uh, it is, um, so it's an essential amino acid in the system. And, and also that glutamine is a metabolic precursor for arginine biosynthesis. And so we have this model here. The green lines are the aphid membrane, so a bactericide cell membrane, symbiosomal membrane, and then Buchnera here. We have glutamine transported by APGLNT1 into the bactericide cell, where the aphid can convert it between glutamine and glutamate using this GOGAT cycle. Um, and then uh, glutamine then feeds into essential amino acid biosynthesis, where arginine is biosynthesized and moved by, we don't know what transporters are doing this part yet, but then arginine is shipped back out to the, the hemolymph, where it then shuts down glutamine transport. Now, that we published in PNAS earlier this year. The slightly unsatisfying thing about it is understanding what con under what conditions do we get arginine accumulating. And that we stumbled on recently. So Xiaoling Lu came to visit my lab from Taiwan, from National Taiwan University for one year. Um, and she started localizing using the APGLNT1 transporter to localize it during development. And so we started asking this question of how they're developmentally integrated. Um, in terms of embryo, in terms of Buchnera, we can think about development divided into these three phases, pre-invasion, invasion, cellularization, and organogenesis. Um, and in terms of the localization, we saw, we see APGLNT1 localizing to three places. To the maternal follicular sheath, that's this purple line around these embryos. Um, when embryonic Buchnera invades, so the green here, we see co-localization. And then um, once the sheath cells form, we see it localized in embryonic sheath cells. So really, we just need to look at the pink bars. And the pink bars here show that, that APGLNT1 is localized to the maternal follicular sheath throughout development. 
So what does this mean in terms of the symbiosis? What it means is this. Um, here we have the embryo with a double layer. It's, it's located on the inner and outer membranes of this maternal follicular sheath, APGLNT1, um, and where it's transporting glutamine into the embryos. And then um, presumably arginine has also been used um, by the embryos. And when arginine accumulates here, it shuts down transport. And so what the localization of, of APGLNT1 to these developing embryos tells us is that reproduction and um, bactericide production of essential amino acids are coupled processes. And so we have shutting down of symbiotic production of amino acids, or actually all amino acid biosynthesis in bactericide cells, when reproduction slows, which can happen with old age, but it also happens um, when an aphid switches investment from reproduction to dispersal. So when aphids start to become winged individuals, um, their reproductive output goes down and there's a tendency for their uh, number of Bucnera um, to also decrease. So um, the sort of frontier question here, and what I'm going to leave us with, is how common and how important will this mechanism of feedback inhibition be at the symbiotic interface of, of other sap feeding insects and other systems? Um, it's work we've started trying to answer, um, but there's still a lot more to be done. So I'll leave it there. <laughs>